You got the owl on? And we'll open the meeting and thanks for everyone for being here tonight. It's a beautiful night in Juniper and a beautiful hall that 10 years ago um, opened up to a new new purpose. And uh, so we're all, I expect everybody will be here August 17th, right? Okay. Not the 10th. 17th. So, uh, no, the, the 10th anniversary is just August 17th, and uh, and uh, this is a beautiful facility. A lot of effort went into this from the volunteers, and, and it's great. They're going to have their anniversary. So, we'll call the meeting to order, and we have the agenda. Uh, you will circulate it with your minutes. Do you any additions to the agenda that you'd like to discuss? I do have one item. I have a letter come in today from uh, Natural Resources on the, the trails, so I'll read that in, in the correspondence. So I need a motion to approve the agenda as presented, or as amended with that one letter from the honor. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. I'm very minded. Nay. Here, uh, declaration of any conflicts of interest based on the agenda. Hearing none, uh, approval of the previous minutes, they were circulated with your package. So the minutes were from our July 9th meeting in Florence for Bristol. Is there anything uh, anything on that that you want to update on? Or uh, anybody have an update on anything like that? There will be a information session with JDI, that's a firm. No date has been set, but they said it would be in August. That's right. So yeah, that was the presentation from um, from Concerned Citizens at our last meeting, and after that, we notified the company that we thought there should be an open house type meeting to inform the public what's going on about that project. And uh, so they agreed to do it sometime in August. I just found it on CBC today, but the date will be sometime in August, and then we'll publicize it and get the word out. And uh, hopefully, it'll be here in Juniper. That's what we recommended. It because it's close to the potential project. So we'll just, yeah, we'll just, uh, once that date is uh, announced, then we'll circulate it around and share it and get the posters up and et cetera, et cetera, for people to come and listen. Right. I'm assuming that the demolition on the back school did not begin Monday, July 15th? They started to remove yeah. the, they started to remove the asbestos and so, or some of the, Inner stop. Uh, the demolition didn't start, but the removal of inner. On the 15th, they did start. Yeah. 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 Wow. So they they have a fence around that building, and the it contractors proceeding to do to to road demolition, and probably the actual demolition of the building will take place mid August, August 15th, so right. time. So, and then uh, go from there. Out of the ashes will rise great things. Yeah. <laughs> so. Any else updates on the uh, on the minutes? Any other updates? Hearing none, uh, can I have a motion to approve the minutes as uh, they were presented uh, from the July 9th meeting? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes from July 9th, or to approve the minutes from July 9th. Yeah. Second. Okay. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Contrary, mine and nay. Carried. Uh, I guess we, we, we kind of skipped over that. We, the business arising from the minutes was uh, two updates from the wind farm potential project and the uh, demolition of the Bass Middle School. So we're in the presentations. We have uh, Stephanie Thornton here. You want to come right up here, Stephanie? And uh, welcome, well, welcome to, yeah. I can't say welcome to John, but we're here. So, so welcome to the meeting, and uh, I'll, let, I'll just turn the floor over to you, then, yeah. then we can have questions after. <coughs> okay, so I just had two quick questions, so Mayor Harvey and Councillors. Um, and my last name is spelled T-H-O-R-N-T-O-N. I noticed that was wrong on my agenda. <laughs> so about, I think, one and a half years ago, uh, some letters went out for unsightly premises, and I just wanted to know where everything is at now that, you know, some people who didn't comply, and where is that now? Oh. What the action is now? Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, approximately last June, June 13th, we passed a bylaw for unsightly and dangerous uh, 
Okay. Premises. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then prior to June 13th, when you sent your letter, it was in May 7th, or your email, sorry. Yeah. So we uh, contacted our, we didn't have no bylaw then, we were just getting going. Yeah. But in the, um, especially we didn't have any bylaws in the LSDs because there might have been a bylaw in Florence and Bristol, but we formed a new bylaw on June 13th, we passed it. Yeah. So prior to that, uh, it was still the responsibility of the province not to pass the buck, but we passed that on to our MLA. Those And there was five major properties there that were identified. Mm -hmm. And then from the list that you'd sent us in, mm -hmm. and they received letters from um, the Department of Environment and Local Government asking, you know, can you make some progress to clean things up? And, yeah. and they, I think the two of them had people visit them. Um, and other than that, uh, we don't have any follow-up from that, to be honest. At least there's no from that, right? So uh, since June 13th, we've had not just Juniper, but we've had different yeah. uh, complaints about unsightly dangerous premises. And we log them, and uh, there's a process there that we do have a bylaw officer now that works for the town, uh, one of our employees. And he goes, visits those locations, you know, see what you can do to clean it up. I mean, we try to be, you know, you try not to be too top heavy, come and, you know, say. And then in one case, we had to send a letter. Uh, maybe in two cases we had to send a letter, sorry. Uh, not not Jennifer, but then... Yeah. Like a second letter, you mean? Yeah, we would right, send yeah. a letter saying um, to these new ones after June 13th, and then they they, you know, they would maybe do a little bit more, and they would do this, and, and if it's just strictly unsightly, which is in the eye of the beholder sometimes, mm -hmm. what unsightly is, but mm -hmm. but the, the, the threshold, the bigger threshold is the unsafe and the... Uh, abandoned homes that could go up into a fire uh, right. that are next to other homes. Right. Uh, dangerous environmental issues like you know oil leaking or chemicals on the property that would be unsafe for anybody to be around. Yeah. And sometimes older vehicles that are rusty and that kids could get into and, and have, tr have issues like these really dangerous type of things. Uh, so, rabbit and what's that? Rabbit animals. Well, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, because so, Travis has you know like rats, mice. Who, mice. There's nobody living in. Yeah, that's 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 another issue. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, those types of things that are dangerous. Yeah. So we we deal with them, and you know we don't have the magic wand to say, you know, you have to do that. But at certain points, if it's dangerous and if it's unsafe, then you could put a little a little more force to it and. There is a process eventually that we can send them a final letter and say you need to clean this up at such such a day and then if you don't it goes through, through the court system and it's just they can appeal it and it, like it's I just know. a long process and yeah and it, it's there's not a perfect solution to that so yeah. so, so there's that, a process sometimes the owners have left the area yeah. and you can't contact them yeah. and it's very and we don't have the financial wherewithal you, our budget is readily available for you folks to look at and you can see what we have available to us to operate mm -hmm. for 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, it's minimal. So we can't go and say, we're gonna go tear down that building on our own dime. And if the other person has abandoned the building, they're very unlikely to show up and say, well, here's $15,000 to clean it up. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Well, you can ask, you can, we can go through the process of getting the province that you can, you can ask for some buildings to be, we can send the letters. And and that's all really we can do. It's like if they if they don't respond, I, I don't know what else. Well, you can go to the court system. Bylaw, you can go to the court system, 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 which we've done for. You can go and get a court order, and they have to do it, right? right. So that's so a process of, yeah. is eighteen months. Is there a fine? And, 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 and there is a fine available yeah. if they don't have the money. I mean, what's the, exactly? Yeah. There are certain people that won't pay fines either, right? The same people that will let their house fall into disrepair. And okay. You try to rationalize. And but you got to you have to separate this because a home with 10 cars in the back of the yard i mean to every some people that may be unsightly but to other people that's that's their way of life right and you, there's a difference you know there's a difference about unsightly right yeah 
And what we've tried to do, and we is encourage, send letters, encourage visitations by our bylaw officer, say, can you, you know, can you start to do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Yeah. And, well, I guess we're just asking for another nudge to that bylaw yeah. officer then. Yeah. Um, like, for example, when you go down around by the store, there's a house for sale, a blue house. She's already had to bring down her price 20 grand because there's 20 junk cars across the street. Nobody wants to live there. Yeah. So um, I guess my second question is, is then at what point do you deem a house condemned? Well, that's not a good question. Uh, we don't have the power to condemn a house. It has to be condemned by the, and I know this is not what you want to hear, but it has to be condemned by the property owner. Like the property owner has to bring in an engineering, or we could bring an engineering firm in and incur all that cost and a vacant house. But if somebody's there, we can't. No, nobody lives there. It's okay. a building. So it's vacant? There's three so, homes that are vacant. So we, we'd have to bring an engineering firm in to say, uh, do a structural analysis of that house. And they would say, well, it, it's not safe, right? Or it's whatever. And then. Then well, you go through the process, well, who's going to tear it down? So who's going, to, who's going to pay for it? So that falls back onto us, and then we're we're stuck with a vacant property, right? So... What if uh, we volunteered to pay? What's that? What if we volunteered to tear it down? <laughs> well, it's, uh, okay, what do you call a house? It's hard to go on to somebody else's property. I mean... Uh, yeah. But if they were given all the letters and right down yeah. to the last thing i mean there is a tree growing in the house coming out the window and out the roof is yeah. that something that should be condemned the yard doesn't have i would say that we you just look at the house and know what it has yeah to i know what house you're talking about yeah. yeah but i mean the tree is coming out the roof yeah and it's dangerous that's there's who owns not the unsightly it's dangerous yeah. who owns the property is this being filmed i'm not going to say well you must know yes, who owns the property yeah i know who owns the property and you can get a hold of them Quite easily. You know. So it's, it's so, so we'll tell us which property this so I can. Well, I'll tell you after. Okay. <laughs> right across yeah. from my side. So there you go. Right across okay. from. <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah, to, to answer your question, that can be looked at by a structural engineer and so they can condemn it yeah. and then it needs to be torn I mean, down. So it falls back on the municipality to, to do all that and then. Yeah. Well, but we hope the bank condemn condemn it has to be done by the province, mm -hmm. not by us. What about if the bank comes in and looks like? Condemn the What's that? The bank. Somebody's paying for this home that should not be paying for it. And maybe the bank came in and looked at it and said, no, I don't think this should oh. be paid for. I think it's one big bank is getting the money. They don't yeah, care. I, I don't know. That's a foreclosure. Mm -hmm. They can do whatever yeah. they want. I mean. It's just. But there's raccoons and rats and mice and everything no else. Okay, so I, why don't we send our bylaw? We need to be clear that we yeah. cannot condemn a house. The province yeah. has to condemn it. The municipality cannot do that. So can you get yeah, in touch with whoever that person is? What's that? Can you get in touch with whoever that person is? Yeah. Okay. Well, we, but these aren't unique either. Like, yeah, the, they're all so, over. Just so you know, the, it's not a unique situation to here. Oh, it's, no. It's, it's, I traveled to Bathurst over the weekend. <laughs> and I saw many of them everywhere. Yeah. So it's a sign of the, just the signs of the times. Yes. Sign, yeah, right. and, it is and, unfortunately. And you can't yeah. and you can't force them. It's, if they're living there, I, maybe you can force them. But can you get them from the stone? I'm talking no, about no, the no, abandoned. It's the owner. I know the owner, and I understand the situation. You know, it's. But it's like crazy. when they no. abandoned it, and then it's just left there for the community to look at. And they're gone. They don't have to deal with that. Okay. So. I, I, understand, I understand your frustration. I, it's not that. It's just if if we had to tear down every building that's I that I would say that needs to be tore down in this district, <laughs> we'd be bankrupt by yeah. the end of this month. So here's what we'll yeah. do: the list that you sent in, we'll have our bylaw officer make an arrangement through our clerk to come out and visit these. Yeah. Well, it might not be this week, but first or next week. Can you make note that and then, that one address now has a tree coming out the roof? I, I don't think <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There I go. There. Thanks, Tim. Um, so, correspondence. Uh, and we'll have a, after this meeting, we have an open question and answer okay. period. So, you, on any topic. And the camera will be off. <laughs> So the next item is uh, correspondence with uh, 
with some letters here. We had a meeting with the uh, on our trails, the trail that runs through MB Trails, and it's an, it's an ongoing issue. So I'm ha I'm going to read one correspondence, and then I'm going to have the deputy mayor read this one. They just came in today. So. Uh, this is to the town. Uh, thank you for your correspondence on May 24th, 2024, regarding your concerns about the misuse of the provincial trail system in the District of Carroll North. The Department of Justice and Public Safety is responsible for the enforcement of regulations related to off-road vehicles on provincial trails. I understand you have spoken to a peace officer with inspections and enforcement in New Brunswick about your concerns. And we're informed that increased enforcement and patrols will be conducted in your region. In terms of trail maintenance, restoration, and designation of specific, specific areas for motorized vehicles, those matters fall under responsibility of the Department of Natural Resources. As such, I am including my colleague, the Minister of Natural Resources, in, in this response. I appreciate your time, et cetera, et cetera. And that's by Chris Austin, the Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. So that's the enforcement piece. And then I'll have the deputy mayor read the other piece. Mayor Harvey, thank you for your correspondence to Minister Chris Austin concerning the misuse of the provincial trail system in the District of Carleton North. Your correspondence was forwarded to me as it pertains to my areas of responsibilities as Minister of Natural Resources and Energy Development. I understand departmental staff recently added a council meeting in the District of Carlton North to discuss the application process for a non-motorized re recreational trail license of occupation on Graham land. Additionally, multi-use trail opportunities were discussed, as well as the roles and responsibilities of the license holder with regards to trail maintenance and development. Please direct comments or questions regarding the the matter to Tanya Morehouse, Provincial Trail Coordinator, by email at tanya.morehouse at gmb.ca. Thank you for sharing your concerns. Sincerely, Honorable Hugh J. Fleming. So we'll just have a discussion on that so that bring everybody up to speed. So we did meet with Tanya Morehouse and her associate from the Natural Resources about the trail that runs in through District Crown Road from Stickney to Dr. Kent. And also the trail from Centerville, the old CN line from Centerville to uh, towards Woodstock. And that is owned by the province of New Brunswick. It's owned by Natural Resources. And uh, it's leased in the wintertime, as you know, to the Sonoma Clubs, uh, the Federation. And that's an exclusive lease where you're not allowed to walk on the trail, which most people don't realize that. Uh, in the other eight months of the year, it's... Uh, it's open season, people walk on it, obviously, and uh, it's, it's non-motorized in our area. So we've been looking at a bunch of initiatives. It's some of us, you know, to see what our options are for the future, but more opening up legally to motorized vehicles, um, and that opens up the whole world for trail, trail usage, right? Uh, up and down the St. John River, and connectivity to the Skidale Ridge Trails and that sort of thing. And then it opens up opportunities, but it also requires some infrastructure improvements through in the towns specifically, because in some towns widen their trails out and, and you can have a, a two lanes, so to speak, one for going each way, one for, so it would accommodate the walkers and the motorized use of the trail. And then the, so that could be some infrastructure improvements, but who pays for that and all that, like it's, it's owned by somebody that, it's owned by the province, so it's going through, it's like a road going through your, your village, right, or your town. So, and they have no money to fix it. There's uh, some repairs to be made. They have a limited budget to fix it, sorry, to maintain it. So we get complaints all the time about the bushes growing in and uh, the, tra you know, the trails in unsafe condition is down by Tapton Road and everywhere. So it's an issue and it's a safety issue because people, are on it, they're walking, there's four, there's motorbikes on it, young people that, being young people, that's what they do, which is, you know, and there's no enforcement. Contrary to the minister's letter, there's two people enforcing the trail from Nacquick to the, the Quebec border. <laughs> so we don't see them and they're not around and they can't chase the violators because they have a no chase policy, so that if they see somebody, they're not going to chase them anyway. So. 
But it goes back to local law enforcement, and it's one of the reasons that we believe that we need more community, we need community policing in place that serves our communities and can go see the parents if there's violators. And sometimes going to see the parents is better than chasing them. Um, and then let the parents you know, deal with it, you know, to some, some degree. So all these things being said, uh, we're, 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 you know, we kind of let, the first year we didn't do much with it, but we're going to do some stuff with the trail and we're trying to get the government to whatever that looks like. If it, we can take over a, a certain portion of it, but with that comes responsibility for maintenance and, and management, right? So, and what's the available to help compensate that is like we don't have money for trails either and it, it's a but it, you can make money available if it's a if it's a good initiative right so so anyway that's kind of the background of those trails and uh, we think it's a op huge opportunity to connect not only for well, some good people connect to the trail and come back into juniper and different parts but we think the atv and the side by sides could be the same thing and uh and we feel they should be allowed to do that so uh, that's my more of my personal opinion, but I so, believe that they just opened up what seventy six more kilometers mm, today. Yeah, yesterday, yeah, uh, up river because so, there's a lot of long trails up there. I believe it's so the that's where that issue is, and then that's where that correspondence came from, and and we'll see where it goes. But we're uh, we're hope to have a meeting with Quad New Brunswick soon, and because they can. They're the group that represents the side by sides and ATVers, as the federation represents the film uh, bills. So maybe they could do a lease on it, and we could partner with them. I don't, you know, we don't know what what that looks like yet. But. And then the other thing is connectivity. It's one thing for us to do it, but if we can't connect to the Perth or Hartland or Woodstock, you know, it's good for us. But it's, a lot of people will like to go down along the St. John River and uh, connect to Woodstock, right? But, Okay, so we'll see how that goes, but it's uh, something we have to deal with eventually. Any questions on that, on the trails? Okay, more correspondence. This is from, and this issue came to light here about a month ago uh, with the school buses. So we sent a letter. Uh, Council sent a letter to the Minister of Education. So, thank you for your correspondence dated June 12, 2024, expressing the District of Carl North's concern with the findings of a recent Auditor General's report on pupil transportation. The Department of Education and Early Childhood Development and the seven school districts take the health and safety of our students very seriously. The operation of school buses is a joint responsibility of education, school districts, and the vehicle management agency of DTI. I can assure you that I take the findings of the Auditor General's report very seriously. Upon learning of the findings of the Auditor General's report, or commenced immediately to review and implement the recommendations from that report. Education's response to the uh, report's recommendations can be found on the published report of the Auditor General's website. Upon review of the details contained in the report, we can confirm now that school buses that are in service are being inspected. That's good to know. And on a regular basis. The instances identified in the report were for school buses that were no longer in service or were undergoing repairs. We can also confirm that all, all school bus drivers are fully qualified to operate a school bus. The, the report found that drivers' files we're not being kept up to date with current documentation. This has been rectified. Hmm. School buses with serious, school, serious mechanical defects are never allowed to operate. Again, the report identified some concerns with the record keeping on bus maintenance reports. Work is underway to review and rectify these deficiencies. Thank you for your time. Uh, Bill Hogan, the Minister of Education. Please, you for some people under the bus there. So, that was that issue of pardon the pun. I meant that pun. That was a good one. <laughs> so that was the issue that we sent a. It was out in the Auditor General's report. It was quite serious because there was issues with the the drivers' uh, records and then the safety records of the buses. And uh, anyway, but apparently the Auditor General, according to Bill Hogan, was wrong. Mm. Well, that's what he says right here that the Auditor General's report was wrong and that there, none of those 
Why would they be inspecting school buses that weren't being run? Exactly. That were getting maintenance. Like exactly. I don't believe. But mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so that's the letter in return. That's so letter. Letter. Sometimes the auditor general can put a lot of heat on the government, which they should, uh, make them hold them, hold them accountable for, and they probably went through the hoops to get this rectified uh, quickly, I'm guessing. So, that's good. Any other questions on that? Okay. Uh, so, that was a school bus safety update, and under bylaws and policies. Is it in the Dean Air Trails letter? No, that was the two letters. I read one and that's oh, okay, the one. I read one. So under the bylaws and policies, there's no updates uh, for that, but we will be looking at our policies in August, uh, updating, looking at policies that we started last year, like different, we have different ones. And uh, so just to let council know, and new business, Rail Safety Week. So uh, I'm gonna read this resolution. Uh, Rail Safety Week. Whereas Rail Safety Week is to be held across Canada from September 23rd to 29th, 2024, whereas 229 rail crossing and trespassing incidents occurred in Canada in 2023, resulting in 66 avoidable fatalities and 39 avoidable serious injuries. Whereas educating and informing the public about rail safety, reminding the public that railway right-of-ways are private property, enhancing public awareness of the dangers associated with highway rail grade crossings, ensuring pedestrians and motorists are looking and listening while well near railways, and obeying established traffic laws. We'll reduce the number of avoidable fatalities and injuries caused by incidents involving trains and citizens. Whereas Operation Lifesaver is a public-private partnership whose aim is to work with the public, rail industry, and governments, police services, media, and others to raise rail safety awareness. Whereas CN and Operation Lifesaver have requested our city, city council to adopt this resolution in support of our ongoing efforts to raise awareness, save lives, and prevent injuries in communities, including our municipality. So, that's a resolution that uh, is for Rail Safety Week on September 23rd to 29th, and, uh, and we need a councillor to move it in a second. I move to adopt the CN resolution as presented. And seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Dr. Mike, nay. Okay. So that's that. The next item is the wild parsnip, parsnip discussion. And I'm gonna have the deputy mayor lead this discussion and we'll have a so I, on this issue. So I brought this up to council. Um, we, I received an email from the Agriculture Alliance and they, at their AGM, they have a lot of farmers that are concerned about the wild parsnip that was growing around their farmland. And so what they're doing is they're gathering information from the farmers um, to where the parsnip, wild parsnip is, and they're going to submit it to the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. So they want, they want to be able to submit a big package to DTI so they can put it in their budget on increased mowing. So I thought it would be a good thing to bring to council as, you know, it's not just against agriculture land, it's against a lot of roads. So I thought that we could look at it, maybe identify areas where it's really bad, and also submit a letter to a DTI. So that was my thoughts on that. There's like a big patch right behind the NCRC right by the ball field. Yes, there was also a there was a, a complaint on yes, Facebook today. There was. Yes, and I noticed it last week when we were at ball, and there's like a lot of young kids running around. And that it is something we should get looked at, getting rid of spray. Something. They're never going to address it because it's too costly. That's that's the issue. Yeah, I brought I brought it up to our MLA. I was traveling from Moncton. I come up the back way, and some of that ground through Majorville that used to be agricultural ground that yeah, has awesome. since fallen into fallow. This stuff started. It came the seed came over a load of salt. 
when, when they shut, shut down the pot, Sussex potash mine, we used to get our salt out of there. We started getting the seed or salt out of Russia, and then we ended up with all the stuff being spread alongside the roads. And now it's a thousand feet back, clear to the woods, and eventually you're not going to be able to get out of your car. And I suggested that the province needed to do something to abate this, and they've done nothing in their intervening four years other than most farms will go along and they'll mow five feet. That's all we can reach with our mowers. We, we mow that back, and we try to do it a couple times a year before it goes to seed, because mowing now, when it's already gone to, it's headed out into seed, all you're doing is knocking the seeds down, so the next year you get the 30,000 seeds from each of those plants to propagate the following year, and then the next year, and the next year. I, I don't know what the answer is, but it, it would be a, such a commitment. And, and I got the same from Ann Belleville, the, yeah. from the, the Agricultural Alliance. But even if we as a municipality also showed... You can, yeah. This, we certainly yeah. can. And they start getting more and more letters. And even if they made a recommendation to mow it earlier, maybe. Yeah. It's got to be mowed early and off. If they did it five years running, but now it's back 70 feet from the side of the road. It's, it's You're never going to stop it. No. Or without, without like they did in New York State. They they spent hundreds of millions of dollars and they eradicated them. But, but there we're, are we're still areas there. that do not have this. So. No, up, up in Bathurst, there, there was the thing. I don't know if they spray or what they're doing there. But It's on the 107, but it hasn't cleared, it hasn't reached Juniper. No. But it, it is close. It's like past fossil. Yeah, yeah. it's come. So what you should do is take pictures and send them to Amy, and we should send a strong letter in that mm -hmm. because the government, you know, with that, I'm sure other municipalities are doing the same thing, and it is an issue. And I think the key, though, is you're never going to get the government to spray it. I mean, that will never happen. Mm -hmm. I'm, well, I shouldn't say never, but they'll probably never spray it unless it's deemed that that's their last resort. They have to spray it, right? Mm -hmm. But they may do more mowing, but mowing is good, but if you can view 10 feet, it's back to 20 feet, so you can't, it has to be a specific mower that's going to do all that at the right time of the year before it seeds up. So it's a big commitment. And, and it's by the program. So what is wild parsnip? Like, is it a weed or invasive? You look in the ditches from Glasswell to Bristol, it's like a yellow, flowery, <coughs> or hogweed. Oh, hog weed, 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 the sap and then the sun, when the sun hits your skin at the same time, it has to have sun in order to work. If you're not the sun, it will not burn you like that. But it leaves whiskers and burns. It's very, very dangerous. Very. I've never heard of that. That's very nice. It's not over yet. It's nothing. I think that we should educate our municipal staff, especially the young students on that. I hope that we have it. Because I know some of them have got it and they need to be. Does it hurt farm animals and, and wild animals uh -huh. too, as well as kids? I've seen the images on uh -huh. some of the ag sites where it'll show it'll hurt your dogs. animals that have eaten it and, and the blister alongside their faces uh -huh. and that sort of thing. But it's going to get to the point where you're not going to be able to walk down to the brook to fish. Like that's what that's what we're getting to now. You're not. You can't pull off the side of the road. You can't walk into the woods. And eventually we're going to get there. Okay. That's I mean, I don't know how much noise we can make. Let her be right. So what we should do is take some pictures. We'll have staff. Or if council has pictures along where you live, mm -hmm. take some pictures. It's everywhere. Send them to Amy. We'll do up a strong letter that it's very relevant in uh, Carl North, and then send it on the government. That's all we can do. That's what they want us to do. The department or the mm -hmm. agricultural alliance, and then. You know, they'll have to figure out a provincial strategy how they're going to eradicate that. I mean, it's way beyond our pay scale what that looks like. And I think, you know, they'll have to, they'll have to figure it out. But if we can do our part for awareness, send it in. Well, the so, problem is create the problem by importing 
the salt yeah. has to be held responsible to yeah. clean it up. Yeah. That's right. It's probably why they don't have it out of, in Bathurst because a lot of their salt comes out of Quebec. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I suspect that's why I, when I was traveling, like, oh, well, all, all I could see was that purple blue stripe, which used to be a problem. We used to say that's an invasive species, but it didn't burn you. It was just it was a pretty purple flower that mm -hmm. blew in here. So I'd like to have that back. Mm -hmm. but, Wild parsnip has eclipsed it and taken it out. Can you so, imagine that the province had their own salt mine? Right? Imagine if only we had one of them. We hadn't closed it down. Yeah. They were really so, <laughs> so uh, okay, let's do that. Let's, let's try to have a letter drafted by Amy and uh, send in some pictures. If you got pictures, are worth a thousand words. And if any citizens have pictures, they want to send in to they can send them in too because. Uh, it's everywhere, and, yeah. So we'll do that. That's a good point. Everybody good on that? Yeah. Motion to submit application for EF, EAF funding. So we have a motion uh, to do that, and we'll have a discussion. Uh, motion to submit application for EAF funding. The Andrew and Laura McCain Public Library Building at 8 McCain Street requires updates for accessibility upgrades, which include the replacement of the current concrete ramp and an alteration for the, of the bathroom. The motion is to approve to submit the application to the Enabling Access Accessibility Fund, EAF, to secure funding for upgrades to Laura and McCain Public Library. Second here. I'll second that. Uh, discussion? So I know I've been part of this conversation for quite some time because I sit on the library board <coughs> as the counselor. And the wheelchair ramp is in disrepair. It's it's mm. embarrassing actually. And then inside the library, the washroom door is very, very heavy. It's large enough for a wheelchair, but it's very heavy. Anybody in a wheelchair couldn't couldn't pull it themselves. So I so they've been working on accessing funding with the enabling accessibility fund. So I think it's a great initiative. So McCain's won't help with that funding instead of it's, your money? We own the library. Sorry. It's, 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 it's just the name on the building. We own the building. Yeah. That's the reason we're right. just doing the application. That program is a federal program that's available to any group. I, I don't know if you guys get that here or not, but it's available for accessibility. I know the I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a few buildings like in Bristol that got them through non nonprofit agencies. Uh, uh, I know that for sure. But anyway, we can apply as a municipality for this funding and any any building that we would own. And that's why we're applying for the library because it's uh, it's really well it's needed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, any community group can apply for that funding too. And, and we can send that out to all of our community groups there's a link there just to, if you have issues on accessibility. It's not only about getting in your building, it's within your building for washrooms, renovations, and for community use. So, so anyway, we'll, uh, we have a list there of all of our community groups. Uh, we'll send that out to uh, that link. So we're just applying for the funding. We just need a motion to, because uh, it is a municipal building, that we can move forward with that. Because our contribution would be 25% of the cost. So, so we have the motion in the Any, Anything else on that? <laughs> so, we, all in favor of submitting the application? Uh, Aye. Aye. Contrary mind? Carried. Thank you very much. And the next one is a motion for the Capital Warning Board. Uh, Councilor Branch. Resolution to cancel that the local, uh, that the local government of the district of Carlton North submit to the Municipal Capital Borrowing Board an application for authorization to borrow for capital expense for the following term and amount. That's for the equipment, the equipment truck for the Central Fire Department to the sum of four hundred and seventy thousand or four hundred and sixty thousand dollars over fifteen years. I certify that the above is true and the exact, uh, the exact copy of the resolution passed by the Council of the Local Government of the District of Carlton North on the 23rd day of the month of July 2024. Adam Sacker? I'll second. 
Discussion? Everyone add anything to that? No, just we, it's the rescue truck that they have right now is uh, 1991 and it's done its job and it's that's the one that leaves them every once in a while. That's the one that leaves them alongside the road. Mm -hmm. So, so what happens over. to the old truck? Will we sell it? We'll sell it. Like, it'll sell it. Tender. Yeah. Tender. So now that the, used to be some of these LSDs, the fire departments, they would go through the province through the capital leases. And so we have capital leases we inherited for just FYI for, for a bath fire department for two vehicles. Uh, uh, Juniper Fire Department, one vehicle, and the Lakeville, we just paid that one off. We inherited that too. But those were capital leases because they were done through the province. We inherited when the amalgamation came into effect. <coughs> and, but now that we're, we're all one municipality, we can borrow the money through the Municipal Capital Borrowing Board, which is uh, set up through the province. We get really good interest rates, and we can turn it out for five years, 10 years, 15 years. So in this particular case with this vehicle, we'll definitely go 15 years because it's the life of the vehicle is at least 20, and uh, but it's a rescue van for the son of a fire department. And next year we'll, or later this fall, we'll be doing some more for fire trucks and potentially in Glasgow and other fire trucks that we have to replace. Actual <coughs> fire vehicles, trucks, pumper trucks, and all that. So. Yeah, so that's the mechanism there, how that works, and uh, is fifteen years the longest? This is the longest you can go. Yeah, and some of the stuff with roads you can do five years, and buildings, you know, ten years. But there's kind of guidelines there. What you can, what they would recommend for amortization. So, yeah, so in this case, we'll definitely go fifteen years. So that has to go from a resolution of council to this board, and our clerk will send it after this tonight's meeting and. It'll go on their list of different municipalities will say we need to borrow this much money for certain reasons and it'll 99.9% .9 get approved and go from there. So that's kind of that and uh, so we need a, we have a motion so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Carried. <coughs> so that's that. Thank you, Laura. Councilor Bradstreet and council statements. Uh, we'll start with Councilor Bradstreet. I attended uh, two fire committee meetings and uh, meeting with the mayor and the CAO. Um, and I, uh, I also attended the Carl County Toy Run. Uh, it was up substantially this year uh, 212 bikes uh, compared to just over 100 last year. So. Uh, yeah, it's a great, great organization that does a lot of work for the, for the, for the hospitals, really, for, for the sick kids. So it's great to have them around. Good. Councilor Oates. Last weekend I attended, two weekends ago, I attended the Blasphole Rec Department had a flea market going on. Uh, it was a... Uh, Nice event uh, on ball field there. Um, bought some stuff. Uh, my son traveled with me and he bought some things. And, and uh, later in the day, I went to French Friday where I watched Mayor Harvey get beat in an eating competition, which I was surprised. <laughs> You've been training your whole life for this. I got second. Yeah, I know you got second. That's first loser. Second is first loser. First loser. It's all right. <laughs> I'll do better next time. You've got to practice for the winner. Uh, so that I visited the Upper Kent. They had a, the rec center had a poker run and barbecue that was uh, well attended. Uh, and I over the week last weekend I traveled to Bathurst Hospital Hospitality Days with my son Garrett. Uh, fantastic concert featuring uh, the, uh, an iconic Canadian band, the Bare Naked Ladies, um, which is the name of the band. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it also featured Signal Hill from Newfoundland were there. They were, did, they did a great show. And uh, had a board meeting with the Child Care Center in Bath to discuss their plans for expansion. Um, attended a balloon meeting last night. And 14 balloons will be going up into the skies on Labor Day weekend from Bath and traveling throughout the district. Uh, and if you want to book your flights, they'll go online later this week. So, yes. 
Well, that's a little clogged for the bath. <laughs> Below the bath, in case you weren't paying attention. So, council, thank you, Councilor Watson. Hey, everybody, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, I went to National Clutch Friday. I chewed Mayor Harvey on. He wouldn't listen to me. I told him to quit chewing and just swallow it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he would have won if he'd listen. <laughs> now, it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of people there. It was a good day. Beautiful weather. Um, I also attended the Big Iron Show and Shine, truck show and shine down in uh, Woodstock. Beardsley Road, I think you're down that way. Huge turnout, huge crowd. What a great event. They raised money for the Big Brothers and Big Sisters last year. I'm not sure if it's the same this year or if they're doing for the local food bank, but they had well over 2,500 people in attendance. It has grown immensely in the last couple of years. It's only new, it's three years, I think they've been doing it, two or three. So shout out to those boys, they did a great job, beautiful. If you've never gone to one, you should take a stroll down next year. It's kind of neat to see all that equipment in one area. Other than that, just relax. Councillor. Connor. Hi, I went to French Vibe Day as well for a short short visit. Um, my kid said it was boring. <laughs> I thought it was hot. <laughs> um, but it was really hot and there was a lot, there was a big crowd there. Um, and I attended my nephew's grad party and I had a balloon fest meeting last night. And I did have one complaint about peat moss <laughs> and local residents' properties, which I have discussed with the mayor. And we can discuss that after, too. That's it. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. I attended the music night at the Cathedral in Centerville, and I attended French Broad Day at the Potato Room. Or Potato Room. Pot World. <laughs> 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 Different party, man. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank Deputy Mayor? Um, I attended a meeting with new Chancellor Ryan, Ryan Dickinson, who sent his regrets. I don't know if we mentioned that. Mm. Um, and <laughs> Chancellor Oaks and Mayor Harvey and our CAO, Amy McIntosh. Uh, Ryan, Chancellor Dickinson wanted to, an update on what we've done to recruit medical practitioners to the area. So we had a meeting, we worked on a timeline. And so we worked on the timeline and then we sent that. Uh, sorry, Gabby Mann is also there. She's our economic development manager. Yeah. And she's going to work on the timeline and then and suggest next steps. So we're just bringing that back to the forefront because we still need doctors. Um, also attended the past two Saturdays, I've attended two swim meets. Um, my children are part of the swim team for the District of Carlton North. One was in Perth and one was in Class Rock, and we brought home the trophy from one and the banner from the other. We have a very large team since we amalgamated it, all of the, the bath and several of the forms of pools. So it was a lot of fun. That's all for Good. Me. Thank you. So, yeah, we uh, had a numerous meetings, but the health care meeting that Deputy Mayor mentioned, uh, we've been working on this file with the doctors in the area, but particularly Dr. Stuart Walker at the Carlton North Medical Center. Or clinic, sorry, and that I don't know if you're aware of it. That's a clinic that the, that we backstop for rent uh, to help get him here, and and uh, it's a it's a five year window that we we help backstop. So we're work, been working with Dr. Stewart and his wife, uh, but mainly with him because she works for Horizon is uh, on healthcare physician recruitment and other healthcare professionals that we need in this area. And, so today I talked to the CEO of Horizon Health, um, Margaret Melanson, and was informed that they, uh, they've been working with Dr. Stewart and back and forth. And so there is a potential for a new doctor to come here in the, later in the fall. Uh, they have to go through their accreditation certification first. And, but they, they were up to, this doctor, she was up to visit with Dr. Stewart yesterday. And, uh, that was good, and but more importantly too, the second part of that is other allied healthcare professionals like nurse practitioners, nurses, dietitians, you know, could be anybody with clinical services can work in that clinic there at Florenceville, which is a beautiful spot, uh, and that's going to the government. They've identified the needs 
and the, the budget for Carroll North, and it's going to the government for uh, approval, and and they have to approve it, and then they can have the money to, to hire these people, hopefully. So if you're talking in the next months ahead, where there could be an election coming up, provincially, that make sure health care is on the top of that top of that discussion, because we need more uh, health care professionals here in Carroll North that service the 10,000 people who live here and, and other people from outside this area. So, so that is going to be a big issue provincially and you should uh, raise that with our provincial candidates. So the next item, we, we did have a meeting with Regional Service Commission on economic development and for the region and, and that's a work in progress and, and we'll see where that ends up with the Regional Service Commission. Did the National French Friday, as Chayla said, and I tried. I was proud of you. I tried, I was proud of you. but I was looking around. And I should have been doing other things. Like I was looking around, looking at you. So I lost like 0.5 of a grain. So oh my goodness. It's close. Anyway, and Brian King beat me. So he was younger than me and about 100 pounds lighter. So anyway, it was good. So we had meetings with the multiplex with the Central Chamber of Commerce, um, with the Amy and. Um, meeting with them on what their plans are for the future there. And and Councillor Stewart was there too, sorry. And Western Valley Regional Games in Perth Andover uh, just happened last Wednesday and I was up to that. We had 31 kids ages 8 to 13 from Carroll North and they competed over a couple of days and it's really fun. I didn't compete in that. No. Uh, we, we signed some documents for land transfer for the Carroll's Trailmaker Stonebill Club, uh, Clerk and I, and that was done last week. Had a meeting with Kirk Evan on Bristol Heights Road and, and some improvements coming down for that road in the near future. And then we had a Regional Service Commission meeting on housing. Uh, it's kind of, they're doing their final report and that, that'll have a needs assessment for Carroll North, which we uh, require that for any type of federal funding uh, that we can spur housing development. So had, we had a meeting the other day with uh, Josh Corey. He's a new hire with uh, Use Work with CN, uh, new hire with Public Safety for the region. So some of you might know Peter Cavanaugh, or he's replacing that position. Uh, so Josh met with uh, our clerk and I, and uh, about public safety, but specifically about community emergency centers for cooling and warming and and even for the district, uh, what's going to be available for funding uh, and how we can facilitate some of that with uh, community centers like here uh, in terms of generators and, and acting for uh, cooling centers, warming centers, and those types of things. We have the fire departments, but those were designated for public safety, not for, I mean, you do what you have to do, right? But uh, we'd like to have a these cooling centers and warming centers uh, in communities like Juniper and Upper Kent, Lake Full, and Mount Pleasant, wherever they may be, along with our district needs, uh, potentially the Florence Floor or Center Floor, and those types of things. So, And there'll be more coming out of that meeting soon. So we had a meeting with the Bath Step Ahead Board, uh, as Councillor Oaks mentioned. Uh, they're doing some new initiatives there, hopefully. And the Bloom Festival Lumberjack event over the Labor Day weekend. Had a meeting last night, and the balloons are great. There's 14 balloons, but uh, and then the biggest thing, if you, ever, if you haven't been to that lumberjack event on Labor Day, and Lawrence has been there, and I'm skiing, but last year there was over 400 people attended that, and Bath was voted the number one lumberjack event in the Maritimes by the participants. So we had 28, 29 participants last year, and it's on schedule to have that many this year on Labor Day. And it goes from 11 o'clock to approximately 4. And there'll be different activities there all through the Labor Day weekend at the Bath Fairgrounds. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the gist of that. And uh, the other thing is this weekend there's a poker run on the water at the Beechwood Community Park. So they, instead of going on ATVs, they go on the water with kayaks and canoes. And, most there's types. land hands as well if you don't want to go on the water. Yeah, and there's a land hand to buy. So that's a Saturday. And there's a lot in the community <coughs> events calendar. So, mostly. and the other thing is, I think on, your, on the community events calendar that we have, uh, we get a lot of traction on that. So 
I know, I know Juniper Community Center has stuff on that for their breakfasts and, and other community events too. So uh, make sure you keep doing that. And, and that's my report. So any questions on that? They always have questions for me. Mm -hmm. Questions. See? Just, my question is, are we going on your boat to this poker rally <laughs> on the weekend? Is that, are we all invited? Could be an option. <laughs> we're going to have to get inner tubes and post all around. So, any other questions? And if not, we'll have an adjournment, motion for adjournment. And then we'll go into an open session. Maybe we'll take a five minute break and so we can grab a coffee. And then we'll come back and do a QA. So, motion for adjournment. <coughs> motion for adjournment. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary minded. Period. So, we'll take a little five minute break. Thank you. Go there.